Good morning, everybody. Happy Wednesday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. What do we have, Crystal? Indeed we do. we got a fantastic panel for you, Max Alvarez and Henry Rogers. We've got Brianna Joy Gray on. She's going to be talking about a new Pentagon pilot program of surveillance of service members, something that Ken Klippenstein exposed. We also have Stephen Donziger on. You've likely heard of him. He is like Chevron's enemy number one. He's going to give us an update on his trial. But we wanted to start with Biden's trip yesterday to Dearborn, Michigan. Yeah, this is a very revealing thing. So Biden goes to Dearborn, Michigan, Ford HQ, in order to go and check out some of the cars, electric cars specifically, test drive them even. And everybody was apparently hailing that as some like a hilarious thing, right? I mean, Bush used to drive an F-150 in the middle of the Iraq war. I happen to remember it well. I'm a fan um, of the f All of, yeah, big, look, F-150 is a great car. <laughs> Ford is a great company. I'm just saying like president's driving car, not necessarily all that novel. Although it was um, to certain members of the press corps who asked permission to ask him a question and then hilariously laughed whenever he said, no, unless I can run you over, just take a listen. Mr. President, can I ask you a quick question on Israel before you drive away? No, you can't. So I'm not unless you get in front of the car as I step on it. <laughs> I'm only teasing. Okay, here we go. You ready? See it, sir. You ready? <laughs> All right, our best test awesome. driver ever. Ha 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 ha. Listen, it used to be my job to be one of those people, and I remember being in the Oval Office, being at any sort of trade show, whatever. I was quite literally instructed by people in the White House Correspondents Association to scream as loud as I possibly could questions at the president no matter where I was in order to try, especially if I was the pooler, which means I was representing the rest of the press corps yeah. when it's a limited number of people, as those people were. Yeah. You don't ask permission to ask a question. You just ask your question. The moment that they stop talking, again, this was under Trump, you'd be like, Mr. President, Israel, Israel, Israel. I mean, you basically just keep screaming until yeah. they the uh, press people like try and shout you out. Almost always you'd be like, we're taking care of Israel or something. I mean, you're supposed to be doing the same thing here. You basically had the ear. If you even have the time to ask permission to ask a question, you just say, Mr. President, do you have anything to say about the Israel-Palestine conflict? And he would be like, well, no, you know, he can't, he, he literally asking permission. Can we ask you a question? You're not supposed to do that. And I know, because I used to have this job. I just think it is crazy because first of all, how many Brian Stelter segments would have been inspired by, mm. I'm going to run you over before you can ask me a question, even if it was clearly a joke? But second, the whole, like, asking the permission, just, you know, hilariously laughing or whatever at the president. I know, I know many of those people who are standing there. I know they wouldn't act that way um, under Trump. So I just think that that was a particularly disgraceful episode. All the way around. Yeah. Um, and before that moment where sh where one of the reporters asked, Mr. President, can I ask you yeah. a question pretty please about yeah. Israel? And he's like, no, I might run you over. Mm -hmm. um, before that, they're like, Mr. President, how fast are you going to go? Mr. President, do you think you would buy this car? <laughs> I mean, just like the whole tenor of the entire exchange is so gross and fawning and obsequious. And by the way, at a moment of, of course, intense turmoil, mm -hmm. where there are incredibly serious questions of foreign policy and international relationships and, you know, a weapon sale that's going through to Israel as we speak, and you're asking permission for whether you can ask the question, and then I think Biden's casual attitude is disgraceful as well. Yeah, it's just a joke. It's not funny. It's not funny when you're in a city that is almost majority Arab American. That's true. Um, largest concentration of Arab Americans anywhere in the country. You don't meet with the community while you're there. Um, there were protests, by the way. I think we have an article about that. There were protests all around the, ci the city as Biden was there um, and pointedly not saying anything about Israel. Rashida Tlaib did um, confront him and talk to him about Palestinian human rights on the tarmac. Um, but then even that, uh, he, you know, went during his speech to try to give Rashida Tlaib some sort of credit or praise for being a fighter without, again, actually addressing any of the resonant issues with regards to Israel and Palestine. And he screws up her name. Listen to this. I'm Rashid Tlaib. Where's Rashid? I tell you what, Rashid, I want to say to you that uh, I admire your intellect. I admire your passion. And I admire your concern for so many other people. And it's my, from my heart, 
I pray that your grandma and family are well. I promise you I'm going to do everything to see that they are on the West Bank. You're a fighter, and God, thank you for being a fighter. Rashid, I, I he, mean, how hard is it to know? How does he not know her name? How, how, um, do you, how are you president of the United States and you don't know the name of Rashid Azaleeb? I was actually yeah. debating with Kyle. Yeah. Is it because his brain's broken? <laughs> is it because he's just so disconnected from, like, the daily discourse mm. of American politics? What is, like, which one is it? And sometimes the fact that he's totally not online is actually benefit yeah, to him. I know. Like, sometimes the fact that he isn't immersed in the daily discourse on Twitter has actually been a good thing. But in this case, I mean, you just look like a fool that you don't know one of the most well-known members of Congress's property. Well, it's just, it, it it's reminds me, he is very Trumpian in so many Certain ways. Certain ways he is. And, and tr that's exactly like the Tim Apple thing. You know, Trump would just famously, like, call people by ri ridiculous right. names and <laughs> completely wrong names. He actually didn't used to say my name correctly. I was telling somebody this Stager, yesterday, right? Stager. And someone was like, why don't you, some very angry people in India were like, why don't you correct him? I'm like, this is the president, man. Like, I got better things. I'm gonna ask a question, that's my job. But it is fascinating in that he gets away with it. And like, I don't even know, did she even say anything? Because that I'm also, aware of. we all know that if Trump had mispronounced her name, she would have called it racist. So let's also say that. But I think it is very insane that not only about the name, but just the way he's treated by the press corps on this, because this is the first international crisis of the Biden presidency, Yeah, hands down. I mean, the first real test, it is the dominating the news. Actually, if I was him, I'd be pissed because guess what? This is detracting all the headlines away from your infrastructure plan, which is actually really popular. Also, that truck is really cool, like, you know, but the way that they're handling this and they're basically keeping it on as much as possible. The other thing is that they are continue. their diplomacy is very strange in that they are keeping it in the news by not doing any forward facing announcements. But then I see in the New York Times that privately, like Biden is pressing Netanyahu, Pelosi came out yesterday calling for a ceasefire, all of that. It seems very coordinated um, to me, but Agreed. the longer that it all continues to like slide in this direction, you're making sure that this continues to be in the news at the very top it's crippling your own presidency. I mean, everybody knows Washington is a zero-sum town, which is that as everybody's focused on Israel-Palestine, guess what's not happening? Literally anything else. Same thing with infrastructure. Management of this type of stuff is always most important. And international uh, pressure is the one area where the president has total and complete control. So everything is actually on Biden in this case. That is exactly right. Yeah. And to go to Dearborn, I mean, this is classic Biden basement strategy. Mm -hmm. To go to Dearborn, Michigan, and not speak with any of the community there who voted for you, by the way, by 70%. I mean, wow. they were all in, the Arab American community, especially in that town, all in for Biden. Not say a word about this situation that's unfolding, to make light of it with that terrible joke to the press corps, to have the press corps just, ha, 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 that's funny, Mr. President, how fast are you going to go? It's really pretty shameful. And you're right that the coverage of that same dynamic with Trump would be... It would be... Wildly, wildly different. And to your point about, you know, these different reports that are being leaked to this outlet and that outlet, I saw, yeah, there was a report in the Times like, oh, privately, it was actually really tough on BB. Okay. There's another one that was like, oh, actually, we think that we were responsible for keeping them from doing ground invasion in Gaza. It's like, okay. I mean, clearly, they're trying very much to win back a narrative of what's been total yeah. impotence. I mean, no matter what you think of this conflict, Biden has now come out and said he wants to see a ceasefire. And Bibi has basically just totally said, like, we're going to do what we're going to do until we're done, and then we'll stop. And also, we really don't care what you think because you're unwilling to leverage any of the actual tools of power that you have at your disposal. So, yeah, we're going to we're going to take the blank check that you've given us. The ground invasion thing is particularly stupid. I actually spent time in Israel. I know people within the IDF and they explained to me in 2015 that they didn't want to do ground invasions anymore because what happened? A bunch of Israeli soldiers were killed and when Israeli soldiers get killed, domestic populace begins to turn against many of the conflicts. So, they much prefer airstrikes and everything else about what they're doing there because they don't have to risk any of their soldiers. Yeah. That's literally part of their military strategy. Right. Ground invasion, and also they had one of their soldiers kidnapped, which turned into this huge yeah. domestic political crisis. Yeah. For, and this was for BB, actually, several, I think it was like a decade or so ago. They will never send troops into Gaza unless it's like a legit 
military war or some level, which we of also course, is we not also going know to what they yeah. did there. I mean, I right. talked about it on my radar yesterday. Right. They intentionally planted the news of an invasion. Oh right, with right. the foreign they press wanted Hamas texting they every contact they had in the English language press, saying we're going right. in, ground invasion, tweeting out. Ground invasion has started in Gaza, and meanwhile telling the Hebrew press the truth that this was a planned ploy to lie to the foreign press to try to increase the body count and the effectiveness of their military strikes. Like, we already know the story of what happened, so for them to come in after the fact and be like, oh, it's actually yeah. it's actually because of us that they right. didn't do the ground invasion. There you go. Silly. They're lying to you. All right, we're going to tell you what's on our radars. That's next.